This is not happening because we're a TV MA. It was intended only for mature audiences. We were discussing the bias. And tonight, the topic is romance. Oh. And tonight, all the stories are about romance. You know, from the bonfire on Sirius XM, please give it up for Mr. Big J. Oakers and everybody. Let him in. I'm going to tell y'all a little story about how and who I lost my virginity to. Uh, so it's going to be gross. <laughs> <laughs> she was older than me. I was actually 17 when I lost my virginity. She was 22 years old. And not a girlfriend or anything. Just a neighbor girl, 22-year-old neighbor girl. She lived with her uncle next door. Who knows what was going on there? She must have been damaged because one day I was walking by and she goes, you know what? I'm gonna make you a man. And I was like, okay, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and she was older and had expectations on the whole deal. So she was like, all right, you gotta get a hotel room. And I'm like, cool, well, now we gotta get my mom involved in this project, please. <laughs> I don't have a credit card. And luckily, I come from great white trash roots. Like, my mom was like, oh, here you go. She gave me a credit card. And I booked a room at a Holiday Inn. And I remember going, yeah. I said I come from garbage. My mom loves her boy. She thinks she's gonna deny me that sweet, sweet. Can't let your mom cock block. Where the fuck did you guys grow up? <laughs> Me and this girl ended up in a hotel, and we walk in the room, and I remember I was very nervous, and she was pouring me like this wine into a plastic cup, and I'm a kid. So I'm like, this is bitter. And she's like, drink it. I'm like, <laughs> and she had a boom box. Yeah, with the Enigma CD playing. Do you remember Enigma by any chance? It's like chanty dance music. It's terrifying in this capacity. I'm already nervous, I got this wine that I don't want, I can't see anything, and just blaring in the rooms like, oh, he, oh, mm. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. She goes, take off your clothes. And I was just all very like, rape victim-y about it. I remember like, here, just now? And I got naked, I thought we were gonna start having sex. I thought that's how it all worked. But she was 22. She knew what she was doing and she just took over and she pushed me down the bed and she started kissing down my body, which is hilarious, because I'm 17, I'm naked, I'm fat, I have no beard. I look like a giant fat baby, that's how I looked. <laughs> and she was kissing like, mwah, 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 and I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then she started sucking my dick, and I was like, I like this part. I thought she was gonna keep doing that, but she didn't. She started doing some pro moves I wasn't quite ready for. She holds up my dick, starts licking my balls, doing a little crowd work, if you will. <laughs> and here is what I learned about my balls that night. And I can't speak for all the balls, but these balls, ticklish. <laughs> and I wanted her to stop. But I didn't want her to stop everything, so I'm just trying not to laugh through the ball-licking part. But it's hard, because she was licking my balls hilariously. Hilariously. She was licking them and vibrating them with her mouth and saying the word balls, which is a weird thing to do. She was like, ball -a las ball -o -lo -za. Zaz. 
And then she did something that nobody should ever do, unannounced to a virgin. She went lower than the balls. You get what I'm saying? Lower than the balls? Los Angeles, Mexico? In layman's terms, she touched her tongue to my butthole. And that, too much for me. Too much, I was a virgin. In one explosion of life, I laughed out loud, peed one squirt and farted in her face. I tell her that <laughs> I'm like, ha ha, pss, burn. Whoops. Whoops. I said whoops. And whoops doesn't cover that. Whoops is like I knocked over your beer or we bumped shoulders. Oh, hey man, whoops. And then I tried to be positive. I was like, you know what? She probably won't even smell it, honestly. That was right in the chops. <laughs> but she did smell it. And when a woman smells your fart and you don't want her to, you panic. You start thinking too quick, you have terrible ideas. I tried to yell over the smell. I remember thinking that's, that's all I had to offer was volume. She's like, what's that smell? I'm like, what smell? Who? Open a window if you smell. <laughs> and then I put on a condom and I remember faking an orgasm. I didn't even finish the first time. But she continued to have sex with me for several months after that. And I remember she moved back home with her parents in a different town in, in South Jersey. Now, I'm Jewish. I'm only mentioning that for the next part of the story. It never seems to come up anywhere in my life that I would have to give a shit. But I pull up to this house and she comes running out and she goes, oh my God, I almost forgot that you're Jewish and I made a, it's a weird thing. I'm so sorry, I should have warned you about this. And we walk into her house. Her father's a Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> and I mean, it looks like Edward Norton's bedroom in American History X. There's big Nazi flags and like, like a skull with like a knife in the, t yeah, it's crazy shit. Continued to plow this chick for a while. And then I really got faced with it. He ordered pizza once. And I remember sitting at the table, I had my moment where he goes, man, a pizza costs $18 now. That's because the Jew bastards own all the fucking banks. And I was just holding pizza. And I was like, I heard that dude. And I started fucking eating pizza. <laughs> you gotta understand, it's the small victories. Five minutes later, I was up banging his fucking daughter to Forrest Gump soundtrack or something. <laughs> You're welcome for the boners, everybody. Thank you so much. You know, there's this guy from his own podcast called Julian Loves Music. Please give it up for Mr. Julian McCullough, everybody. All right, so I grew up in a musical family. We care too much about music, and it hurt me real bad. Uh, I'm actually named after Julian Cannonball Adderley. That's Miles Davis's saxophone player, which is a lot of pressure to put on a tiny white baby. <laughs> so I've always cared too much about music. I get to college, I make the biggest mistake you could possibly make in college besides go to Rutgers. I fell batshit, head over heels, crazy in love with the most maladjusted toxic girl I could possibly find. But when you're 20, you're like, they're the hottest. So um, there were red flags everywhere. She walked into class four days late. That was the first time I ever saw her. And uh, half an hour late that day, she walks in head to toe, all black, black hair, covered in tattoos, sunglasses, sits down in the front row, loud and pissed off, like, like she was trying to sleep and we built a classroom around her. <laughs> She never took her sunglasses off the whole time uh, at 10 a.m. So you're either drunk or an asshole. Either way, I was like, I'm Julian, what's your name? <laughs> and uh, so I ask her out and uh, she says no the first time. I ask her out nine more times. This is when I was young, I was hungry, I was persistent. I'm not like that at all anymore. Now I'm like a cat on a windowsill with women. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, meow. And they're like, no. And I'm like, <laughs> I have the sun. 
so um, she finally agrees to go out with me. You know what I mean? And it's amazing. It works. We start dating. We're boyfriend and girlfriend. I can't believe it. The problem is, it was never even. I was obsessed with this girl. And she was like, kind of on board that she had a boyfriend from English class. Like that was the two <laughs> levels we were at. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship that uneven before, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it because if you're confident, it'll fix it. <laughs> so, we're going out and uh, it wasn't completely one-sided. You know, we did have a song together. Uh, she didn't know that we had a song together, but I picked a song for both of us that I would listen to alone in the dark when she wouldn't call. And uh, it was called Lover You Should Have Come Over by Jeff Buckley. It's a very intense love song from the 90s. Yeah, he drowned. Anyway, I'm laying there in the dark one night in my room alone listening to the song and I get an epiphany from the lyrics about how to handle my situation. One of the lyrics is, she's a tear that hangs inside my soul forever. And I was like, yup. <laughs> and that's when I was like, oh my God, she's had a sad life. You know what I mean? Like her dad ran out on the family. Her mom is addicted to pills. Her ex-boyfriend sold all her stuff for drugs one time when she came home. Everybody that's ever said I love you to this girl has also completely screwed her over. I need to prove to her that I'm never gonna leave and then she'll love me back. This was the logic of a 20 year old boy who didn't know women at all. Because if you like a girl and she doesn't like you back enough, the worst thing you could do is be like, oh, you don't understand, I'm never leaving. <laughs> what I should have done is been like, let's go to lunch and then just left her in a field somewhere. And if she ever made it back to town, she'd be like, you need a blowjob, you're mysterious. <laughs> So, uh, so I get an epiphany in bed and I get out of bed that night and I'm like, I know what I'm gonna do. I walk a block down to the tattoo parlor that's close to my apartment, right? You don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> and uh, I walk in and I go, I would like one tattoo, please. <laughs> and the guy was like, first time. And I was like, you don't know my life. <laughs> he goes, what are we doing? I go, all right. I'm in love with my girlfriend. She's kind of on board. We need to fix it. Uh, we have a song together that she doesn't know about where he says she's a tear that hangs inside my soul forever. She has a butterfly tattoo on her bicep, which is really cool. I need that butterfly tattoo on my stomach where our souls are with tears above it. And he goes, wait, what did he say? He goes, uh, Oh, no! <laughs> no way, dude. I'm not giving you that tattoo. I go, but, but I love her. He goes, how long you been together? I go, six months. He goes, get out of my fucking store. I'm not giving you that tattoo. I go, fine. I'll just go somewhere else and get a worse one. You know, now he knows I'm mature. So he goes, ah, all right. Go home, wait seven days. If you come back, you still want it, and you're not drunk, I'll give it to you. And I was like, you're on, motherfucker. And he was like, it's not a challenge. I don't want to do this. So I go home, I wait seven days, I go back in, put $200 on the counter, and he gives me this. That was 15 years ago. I've been doing comedy for 13 years. This is the first year I've ever talked about this on stage. <laughs> That's how long it took me to be okay with it. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for a hilarious comic, Mr. Bobby Lee, everybody. Oh. 15 years ago, I just want to let you guys know that I just couldn't get laid. I'm shaped like a human dumpling. <laughs> I look like Pikachu with diabetes. I don't look good. I don't even know how to fuck. This is what I do, like a hula hoop. This is how I fuck. So 15 years ago, um, I got a gig in uh, Las Vegas, my first headlining gig, 
at the Riviera, and they were gonna pay me $150, thank you, one show, and <laughs> I'm making it, and uh, they wouldn't fly me out, so I had these two comics drive me to Las Vegas, Brian <laughs> he's a real guy, and Aaron <laughs> and um, we drive to Las Vegas, and uh, we're on Las Vegas Boulevard, and a truck pulls up next to us, a blue truck, with two of the ugliest white girls I've ever seen in my fucking life. They had mullets. They had Confederate flag t-shirts on. They had acid wash jeans. I'm getting hard right now. And they yell into the car, we think you're cute. They weren't talking about me. They weren't talking about Brian because Brian is the ugliest white dude I've ever seen. If you know Brian, he has no jawline or fucking chin. His neck just blends into his face. He looks like a tiki statue. <laughs> or Beaker from the Muppets. <laughs> he looks awful, he has a golem body. You know how white guys have skinny arms and a belly? God damn, he's unfuckable. Anyway, guys, the reason why I just said that, I called him out because I asked him to do the story with me and he said, no, I have kids. Fuck you, Brian. <laughs> they were talking about Aaron and Aaron jumped out of the Bronco. She goes, he goes into the truck and they just drive into the distance, you know what I mean? We're like, hope you don't die. You know? So we go to the Riviera and uh, it's like 9 p.m. And I go, Brian, I need to write out a set list. So uh, just do your own thing. I'll see you at the show, it's at midnight. So I go do my set list. At midnight, I show up at the Riviera and Aaron and Brian rolls up with two girls. And um, Aaron pulls me aside and he says, hey dude, um, if you're funny, they'll fuck you. <laughs> so I go up and I do the show and I'm pretty good, you know what I mean? I'm likable. Focus groups like me. Um, and after the show, um, we go up to the room and it's debauchery. I mean, the air is thick. It's like a Cambodian jungle. You can slice the air with a machete, you know what I mean? And we were all wearing condoms. So it's two hours of just sexualities, and so... <laughs> Eventually, I have the fat one on the bed, right? One of them was fat, by the way. I'm doing doggy style, and um, Aaron has the other one in the other bed, and I look around, where the fuck's Brian? Nobody knows where Brian is. He disappeared. So I go, fuck him, I keep going, right? Then I feel something. <laughs> tickle my anus. It felt like a feather. I turn around, there's no one there. So now I think something paranormal is happening. Like it's Liberace's ghost going hi or whatever. So I keep going, right? Then I definitely feel something rubbing against my anus, right? Brian had crawled underneath my body underneath her body and started eating her out while I was fucking her, which makes him a warrior. I go, get the fuck out of there. He goes, she likes it, she likes it. It's all right. I keep going. I start power fucking her. You know how you do it? Like a rabbit, you know what I mean? And my penis slips out and it goes right into Brian's eye. I've never heard a scream that loud before. <laughs> ah! You know, it's fucking crazy. And then we stopped immediately. <laughs> Putting a penis in an eye is a party stopper. <laughs> so anyway, we get up and uh, I take him to breakfast. <laughs> I do. Because <laughs> I'm a good person, you know what I mean? So we're at breakfast and um, I look across and Brian's eye is completely closed with a yellow film around it. I know. And I go, dude, your eye. He goes, I think we should go to the hospital, it burns. I go, nah. Put some Clorox on it or whatever. I wanted him to lose the eye just for the story. I blinded a man with my penis once. So we get in the car, it's six in the morning, I'm fucking tired. We drive to the, 
hospital, and I don't know what to say. I've never t told a doctor that I poked somebody in the eye with my penis before. <laughs> do you lie? What the fuck do you do? So Brian goes, I got it. So we're sitting there in the emergency room. Doctor walks in, he says, what happened? Brian points at me, he says, he skull fucked me. <laughs> that was a story. Thank you.